Hi there, thanks for listening in to this Java EE7 launch screencast. My name's Danny Coward. I'm the specification lead for the Java API for WebSocket. This screencast will take you through the major features of this new technology for Java EE7. This is a newly incorporated network protocol, and the APIs that I will show you here are based on the rapidly adopted WebSocket protocol. Now, this protocol has been developed in the standards community in order to solve a basic problem that browsers and HTTP request and response applications have had over the years, which is that it's not possible or not very easy in any case for a web application residing on a server to dynamically update all the clients that are watching a web page. So this might be a stock application where you're feeding in real-time stock quotes and you want anyone who's looking at your web application to receive the very latest market information. It might be a chat application where you want to show the list of users that are all logged in and any chat messages that they have. Up to now, all the techniques have been based around some kind of polling technology, which is very inefficient and leads to a lot of wasted HTTP interactions. The polling techniques fetch data whether there's new data to be fetched or not. WebSocket is a, a new protocol which solves this prob problem because it's a bi-directional uh, communication channel that the server and the client and the browser client can open up to share information. And most importantly for the Java EE developer, it gives web applications this ability to push data out to any client, browser, or Java clients, push this data out to them so that they have the very latest information. And this allows you, the developer, to create web applications that are much more richly interactive, where the information is live on the web page and isn't reliant on users doing anything in particular to refresh that information. The WebSocket protocol is part of the larger HTML5 standard. And so any web application that you create using the Java API for WebSocket can reach those updates uh, and those interactions can reach any uh, device, whether it be desktop, tablet, or smartphone, that has an HTML5 enabled browser. There's a very useful website called caniuse.com, which tracks the support of the WebSocket protocol in all the major browsers. If you look down the left-hand side, the current versions of all the major browsers support WebSockets, so we can see Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and those are for the desktop, laptop computers. More than that, you can see that many of the mobile browsers also support WebSockets as well. Uh, the holdout for now is the Android browser, although you will notice on this slide that Chrome for Android currently has WebSocket support as well. So if you choose to use this technology, you know that for most of your clients, certainly all of your desktop clients, you can reach them with WebSocket-enabled web applications. And as you can see, because most of the browsers are supporting this, I think it's only a matter of time before the native browser on Android supports it too. Now let's turn to the major features of the Java API for WebSockets. The API includes all the API and annotations you need to create a WebSocket endpoint. So a WebSocket endpoint is the component that can speak the WebSocket protocol. So if this was a WebSocket component that sent out live updates of stock quotes, the endpoint would reside in your web server and would send out messages periodically as different stock prices were changed and needed updating in the browser. The API offers a choice of approaches for how you create WebSocket endpoints. You can use Java annotations that are defined by the Java API for WebSocket to create a WebSocket endpoint. 
or you can also subclass classes in the WebSocket API for a programmatic approach. So the two options there offer you a choice of sometimes a matter of taste and sometimes a matter of ease of development. Many developers find the annotation approach much more concise and other developers enjoy the programmatic approach uh, better. Now, central in the Java WebSocket API, there's a wide choice of different ways that you can send messages, and we'll see a little bit more about that later. Native to the WebSocket protocol is the ability to send binary messages and text messages. But as we'll see, the Java API for WebSocket offers a number of different modes and means by which you can send messages over those base native formats. In addition to APIs that extend the web server, the web container in Java EE, we've included a client API. And this is very useful to, for developers who want to create a rich client application that interacts with a WebSocket-enabled web application. Perhaps you have a chat application that, in addition to a browser client, you'd like to create a JavaFX front-end to that chat application. Or in a stock trading application, you want to supply a Java client that receives the stock updates, the live information, and additionally provides the means to buy and trade and do portfolio analysis in a rich client application. And of course, because this is part of the Java EE platform, new for Java EE 7, we've integrated this technology into the web container. And there are a number of ways that you can exchange information between a traditional web application built using servlets and JSPs and PHP and so on. You can exchange information with the WebSocket components that you create using the Java API for WebSocket. Now let's take a look at the Hello World uh, application for the Java API for WebSocket. Now this example uses annotations, and as I'd mentioned earlier, this can lead to very clear code, the removal of a lot of possible boilerplate. How you set out to create your first Java WebSocket component is you create a Java class that has the business logic that you want. Now in this example here, we're simply creating an echo component. How it works is any time it receives a WebSocket message, it's going to immediately send back a response. So that is done in this example in the handle message method. The string parameter that's passed in is going to be a WebSocket message. And the return value, again a string, is going to be the WebSocket message that's returned in response to that message. Now in order to take that from a regular Java class with a single method on it and turn it into a WebSocket component, we use two of the annotations in the Java API for WebSocket. The first is the class level server endpoint annotation. And you can see that this has a value attribute of slash echo, the slash echo string. This defines the path by which the web container maps this WebSocket endpoint into the URL space of the web container. This is a little like, for those of you who are familiar with the servlet API, a servlet mapping. It's a kind of WebSocket endpoint mapping. And then the second annotation that we see here is the at on message annotation. This is a method level annotation that is used to tell the WebSocket implementation that this is the method you want to be called whenever this WebSocket component receives a WebSocket message. And that's it, you're done. Now you've taken your Java class and you've turned it into a WebSocket endpoint that always answers when you send it a message. Now there are several other annotations in the Java API for WebSocket. There are actually two class level Java annotations, the at server endpoint that we just saw. This is for turning a Java class into a WebSocket endpoint that's going to reside in the web container. 
And then for developers of rich client applications that want to use WebSockets to interact with a server application, they'll want to create a client-side endpoint, and they will use the class level at client endpoint annotation, the second entry in this table here. Those are the two annotations that allow you to turn a Java class into a WebSocket endpoint on the server side and on the client side. Once you've done that, you can use any of these four lifecycle annotations on the methods of your Java class the at on message annotation which we just saw will turn your java method into a method that will be called when websocket messages arrive at your websocket component now the other three the at on open the at on error and at on close annotations they govern different parts of the life cycle of the websocket component the at on open annotated method is called when a new client first connects to your WebSocket component. It's a little bit like an initialization method. The at on error annotation is used when you want to declare a method is going to handle any errors that come up during the lifetime of a WebSocket component. Perhaps a message comes in that's too big or is incorrectly formatted, and the WebSocket implementation will supply the error condition to the method that's annotated with the at on error annotation. The at on close annotation gives you, in concert with the at on open annotation, the ability to manage any expensive resources that you may want to use for this WebSocket component. Perhaps when you start using the WebSocket component, you need to open a database connection you would do that in the at on open annotated method. And then equally, on the at on close annotated method, you would want to close down that database connection. So that's a survey of all the method and class level annotations in the Java API for WebSocket. I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of different modes and means for processing messages using the Java API for WebSocket. We saw in the echo example that you can send and receive text messages as complete messages. So an incoming text message is modeled as a string object. Equally, binary messages you can opt to receive and to send them as either byte arrays or instances of the byte buffer class. Now, in addition to those simplest forms of receiving and sending WebSocket messages, you can elect to either send or receive them as sequences of partial messages. And this is very useful if you're processing very large messages. Perhaps you're processing images or video files or very large documents. You may want to receive them as partial messages so that you can do some of the processing even as the message is actually arriving. And then finally, you can also elect to send or receive text and binary messages using traditional blocking Java I.O. APIs. This can be very useful, especially if the messages are formatted in a way that you want to use one of the many content APIs that are based on blocking I.O. APIs. Now, in addition to those modes, you can also send or receive WebSocket messages in the form of any Java object you choose provided you provide one of the pluggable encoder or decoder implementations. So let's say you have a chat application and you want to model the messages using a chat message object. This makes it very convenient to create the WebSocket component because it never actually has to deal with encoding or decoding those messages. Well, using the encoder-decoder scheme in the Java API for WebSocket, you can supply encoders and decoders for those chat message objects. And then your WebSocket component only ever deals with chat message objects and never with the lower level representation of the message. And for Java primitives and their class equivalents, the Java API for WebSocket actually builds in support for encoding and decoding those objects automatically. And then finally, for sending messages, you can either send them synchronously 
when you send a message, the call to send it blocks until the, the whole message has been transmitted. Or you can choose to send them asynchronously, where the call to send the message immediately returns so that you can get on with doing some other work in that thread. And then you can elect to receive a callback or a notification when the message is actually transmitted. So you have lots of flexibility in how you design your application and how the, the WebSocket messages are sent and received using this API. So to summarize some of the things that I've told you about and some of the important things in the Java API for WebSocket, we've added WebSocket protocol support to the Java EE container new for Java EE 7. And we've created a standard API that lets you create WebSocket endpoints with two approaches, one using annotations, which is mostly what I've shown you in this screencast, and also a programmatic approach. There are lots of different options for processing the WebSocket messages that you either send or receive in your WebSocket components. And we've also got a client API so that in addition to browser clients, you can also have rich Java or JavaFX clients as well. And the WebSocket API is integrated into the Java EE web container and programming model. This is a great API for developers who want to create very interactive and live web applications. Perhaps you're using Ajax or Comet or one of the existing HTTP-based libraries that emulates server push using polling. This is a great API for you to look at and perhaps experiment with to really bring that efficient interactivity to your web applications. And this reaches anything from a smartphone to a desktop, so you can reach many, many users using this technology. So thanks for listening. I'll leave you with some resources to find out more. If you download the RI for Java EE7, Glassfish, you'll find that Java WebSocket API has already been integrated into it. And you can stay in touch with what's going on in Glassfish using these uh, links here on this page.